Perspectives on Toronto's Past and Present. I am Dwight Drummond, host of CBC Toronto News, and I am very happy to be with you this evening to celebrate the contributions made by tonight's panelists, along with the efforts of many others to the heritage of our wonderful city. Before we begin our program tonight, we do want to acknowledge the heritage that underpins all of our work and the history of this country, province, and our city, our Indigenous heritage. Heritage Toronto's programs take place on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg, including the Chippewas and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, Toronto is host to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. Toronto is within the territory of the Dish with the One Spoon Treaty, which requires responsibility of those who use the land to share it peaceably and to care for it. Heritage Toronto acknowledges the responsibility and recognizes the efforts of these nations in maintaining the land. While COVID-19 has forced the cancellation of the annual Toronto Heritage Awards for the first time in its 46 year history, tonight we honor the spirit of the awards by showcasing the important contributions heritage makes to city building. Along with the pandemic, recent events have heightened, highlighted heritage's role in society from how and what or who we commemorate to the historical context that has shaped issues of identity, place, and belonging. We are seeing massive shifts in not only how we work, but how we define and spend our leisure time with impacts on the local level, on travel and tourism. And tonight, we're pleased to discuss some of these challenges and what this ongoing cultural shift or change will mean for the heritage of Toronto. Let's introduce our panelists, the folks that will be joining us for this discussion this evening. We're very lucky to have this distinguished group. Elana Altman is a cultural planner and designer with a background in art and architecture. In her role as co-executive director of the Bentway, one of my favorite places to go skating, she works with the community to implement innovative and engaging programming, revealing new possibilities for public space and cultivates the best visitor experience possible. Arlene Chan has written numerous articles and published seven books about the history, culture, and traditions of the Chinese in Canada. She devotes her time to researching and relating her firsthand experiences and family stories as a lecturer and Chinatown guide. Eve Lewis is the president and CEO of Woodcliffe Landmark Properties, a real estate company focused on developing heritage properties in the Rosedale, Summerhill, and St. Lawrence neighborhoods. More recently, Eve is redeveloping the Waterworks Building, an iconic historic property into a 290 condominium project with a food hall and YMCA in the King West neighborhood. Sean McAuliffe is the author of Stroll, Psychogeographic Walking Tours of Toronto, Frontier City, Toronto on the Verge of Greatness, and The Trouble with Brunch, Work, Class, and the Pursuit of Leisure. He's a columnist at the Toronto Star, co-founder of Spacing Magazine, and teaches at the U of T. Terry White is a partner at Plus BG Architects with more than 30 years experience. Terry manages the firm's heritage portfolio. His work includes several large scale conservation projects, including the Union Station Revitalization Project, St. Michael's Cathedral Conservation, another big one, and the Legislative Assembly of Ontario at Queen's Park Restoration and Rehabilitation. Wow, that's a good group tonight. Towards the end of the evening, we'll be taking questions from the audience for these panelists. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom to type in your question. You can also upvote questions you want answered in this section. And we will start with a poll question right now. Let's get right to it. What is the future of public spaces, especially heritage spaces in a COVID-19 world? Same as pre-COVID, greater importance to support people's mental health, well-being, and for social connection, less importance as we continue to lean towards digital-based experiences. Vote now, you have 20 seconds. Oh, 
Look at that. What is the future of public spaces, especially heritage spaces in a COVID-19 world? 84% of respondents said greater importance to support people's mental health, well-being, and for social connection. Interesting. All right, let's go to the poll. That was the poll one's results. Let's get to question one for our panelists. I think they're all ready and, and waiting here. I wonder what they thought about that last poll question and the response there. In different ways, all four of your works reimagine the relationship Torontonians have with their city. Looking at Toronto at this moment through the lens of the pandemic, what aspects of our relationship with the city's heritage do you either hope or fear have permanently changed? And we will start with Eve. And you will need to unmute your microphone. <laughs> there you go. Um, fortunately, um, the city of Toronto and um, their heritage department has really, really um, kind of strict bylaws. And when it comes to renovating or repurposing or the demolition of heritage buildings, there's a lot in place that protects it. And um, that would be with the pandemic or not. So in, in terms of that answer, I think it's kind of neutral, but I think what the pandemic has showed is that how much more important, you know, heritage and public spaces and parks are to everybody. And I would hope that in the future, it'll be um, that the public will embrace um, the support of protecting heritage even that much more. Sean? Yeah, I think uh, Heritage teaches us that we've we've been here before. I think of the foot of Bathurst by the uh, island airport or the, the tunnel to the airport. There's the mm -hmm. memorial to the Irish famine uh, with those kind of figures that are welcoming um, people on the boats from Ireland to Toronto. Uh, and, you know, that was a terrible time and probably people at the time wondered, you know, what's like the future was so bleak, right? And, and you know, it, it it, it comes back. Um, and we had the pandemic in, uh, in, in the teens 100 years ago, uh, and we came back. Um, and the thing, you know, there's been a lot of articles and, and, and kind of forecasting about, you know, the end of cities and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I always take those things with a grain of salt, because every time it's happened in the past, the, the city comes back. And um, like you've said, the, the, the parks and some of our public spaces are really amazing in Toronto. When I go to other places uh, unnamed and come back to Toronto, um, I'm always a little flabbergasted at how many people are on the street, even like on a, on a Tuesday night in November um, in regular times, like our streets are full of people. We have this kind of critical mass that a lot of cities um, wish they had. And that's the thing I think that is so uh, valuable, the kind of embrace that the people who live here have uh, of, of the city and kind of living publicly in it. And Terry, you're up next to you. I mean, you're involved in some ongoing projects. What aspects of the city's relationship with heritage do you hope or fear may have permanently changed because of COVID? Well, Dwight, the uh, fears are that the diversity and intensity of downtown life may be affected by a flight to the suburbs and exurbs that will result from the ability to work from home. If people abandon a downtown core, does the economy and vibrancy of the downtown suffer as a result? The tourism that the city generated is gone. The hope is that the local interest will fi fill that void. Uh, we need to focus tourism on the local. The hopes our heritage becomes more valuable. Our need for socialization remains, but getting out, but our getting out skills might change. Will our relationship to Toronto's heritage potentially have us learn more and be more engaged? Torontonians due to restrictive travel may come to do all those things that we say we would like to do in our own city, but never do. These trips may become much more relevant. The opportunity is to be in a local in local places and learn more about them. Uh, mobility is changing. Work from home and virtual meetings has made quieter streets. There is the chance to reclaim real estate previously devoted to the traffic. See the road infrastructure surrounding Queens Park. How ironic, it is a park that was historically gifted to the citizens of Toronto, but is difficult to get to. Or a chance to experience the spaces in the city 
as they were pre-traffic. Imagine Bay and Queen in front of City Hall if it wasn't a busy intersection with all the pedestrians forced into the corners. The pandemic should be a time to radically reimagine the urban space, look at lakeshore closures and how healthy that has been in bringing Torontonians down to the West End lakeshore. This should be an opportunity to implement ideas like pedestrianizing Bond Street at St. Michael's Cathedral. Our relationship with the city's heritage is changing. The pandemic has made us be more engaged with the city, revise our attitude to socialization, recalibrate the urban space. A transportation revolution is currently underway. Interesting. Arlene, we'll, we'll go to you next. And I, I did hear about the exodus to Prince Edward County you mentioned off the top there, Terry. A lot of people from Queen, my Queen Street days moving out to uh, Prince Edward County. But Arlene, uh, growing up in the city, you know, after we went out at night, you know where we all ended up at two, three in the morning. We we're so glad that it was vibrant and open because we all ended up in Chinatown. Well, there are some very good points that have been made, but I, I would like to add a few others. Um, I want to add in our, the way we, um, think of our arts and culture institutions now um, because they've really had to change to, to evolve because they want to stay relevant. They want to keep reaching the audiences, their, their, their target groups. And at the same time, they're reaching new audiences because think of it, we can now go behind the scenes. We can talk to curators. We can see collections that were not visible to us before. So in many ways, our arts and culture institutions are becoming even more accessible and inclusive for us. And, um, but what, what else has really changed and I think is going to have an impact is the accentuation of the inequities in our city. So the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on Blacks and Indigenous peoples, the attacks on mosques and synagogues, the increase in anti-Asian, anti-Chinese incidents, all of these point to the fact that there is systemic racism. And so, um, and if you look at our past, we haven't really recognized all of our peoples and communities. And so this has to change. So we have a long way to go. So when I reimagine what's going to happen, we have to be dealing with these issues. Good points all. And Alana, I will give you the final word on this topic. Um, well, I absolutely agree with what um, Arlene just, just said. Um, you know, I, I think that it's important during challenging times like this to remember that there is no such thing as a fixed city and that part of what makes our cities vibrant and vital are that they're always in flux. And rarely do we go through such wholesale shifts as, as we have in recent months. But I don't think change itself is something to be feared as long, you know, as Arlene says, it's, it's rooted in equitable and sustainable goals for the city and, and it's address, addressing the issues that come to the fore. Um, and I'll just really quickly that we're in the midst of um, presenting a, a project called The Essentials, which is actually off the Bentway site, engaging many different heritage structures along the waterfront. Um, and we worked with incredible Toronto artists, Erica de Freitas, Alvin Long, Winnie Trong, um, and asked them all to reflect on their essential learnings during this time in order to chart a way forward. And what I'm really struck by is so many of them uh, came back to this vital need to reflect on our recent past in order to imagine possibilities for our distant future. So I think that, um, uh, you know, it's not surprising that in our arts and cultural community that they're reminding us of the importance of heritage as a way forward during this time. All right, we'll continue with the next question. I think we actually covered that art project out of the Bentway um, last week. Um, to borrow a phrase from one of Sean's books, Toronto has been described as a city on the verge of greatness. What is the type of investment or, or mind shift most needed to get Toronto to the status of greatness? What is Heritage's role during and, and post pandemic in this? And we will start this one off with Sean since we referenced your book title. Thanks, Toy. Yeah, we called the book Frontier City, which in Toronto on the verge of greatness, which you could kind of say every city is on the verge of greatness that isn't yet great. And you could probably say that about Toronto at any time. But it seemed like uh, when I was writing this three years ago, um, you know, Toronto had gotten to the size and of um, 
of critical mass again, uh, but also sort of resting on these laurels of being this kind of utopic city that it was called in the 1980s, maybe, or 1970s. Um, and, and there were these kind of linchpins that were that could topple it over. And most of them relate back to that uh, inequity that Arlene uh, mentioned. Um, and that that has to do with transit, that has to do with uh, income, uh, housing. And if we don't solve those things, um, the, this kind of great thing that we've built or, or potential of great thing um, uh, might not become as great as we hope it could be. Um, the, the way heritage fits into it, I think, is that um, an incredible amount of resources and effort went into building the city that we've got now. Um, and, and some of it wasn't that great, uh, but a lot of it was. And I think of especially like the, the schools that were built in the 50s and 60s that, uh, that weren't updated enough um, because we didn't fund them enough. And now they have HVAC problems uh, during the pandemic, um, but, but they're solid schools. Uh, and, and we have this kind of great, um, uh, heritage, uh, built heritage in the city that we we have to build on top of. Um, and so I think that's where heritage preservation and, and all the people that care about it who are watching this thing today kind of come in. We can kind of advocate for uh, the stuff that we've already got uh, because it's a good place to um, build from. And you're right, we do have some incredible school buildings in the city, but they're old and they're beautiful, but they're in need of a lot of work. And Terry, you, you worked on some of these older buildings, trying to bring them into the present day. What do you think of that? What, what, what do we need? We're on the verge of greatness. What's it going to take? Un unmute your uh, microphone. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. OK, um, the new reality of virtual is a powerful mind shift. Um, eliminating archaic ideas of work and workplace has helped alleviate Toronto's gridlock. People's time has become available for personal use. A shift away from travel to work has benefits for work from home. This has resulted in improvements to the environment and the quality of the air. Toronto's greatness is its diversity. Diversity of how we get around, diversity of our neighborhoods, diversity in our relationship to history, diversity in outlook. Some see a brave new world, others see greatness in preserving heritage, others in renewal and repurposing. There is reduced passenger load on TTC and Metro links. Much like that on the roads, there has been an easing of the use of the public transit infrastructure. This has led to an improved environment and this can make Toronto great. We must ensure that Toronto's heritage is maintained so that the city does not become a bland metropolis. Toronto's greatness is in its diversity and multicultural coexistence. This is appropriate for a global world and makes Toronto one of the most attractive places to live and come to in the world right now. It is important that Toronto's multicultural heritage is celebrated and promoted. Conserving Toronto's heritage as somewhere for a migrant community, an individual to settle and thrive and meaningfully contribute is very important. Look at the story of St. Michael's. The impact of a previous pandemic led to the inclusion of Catholics by a predominantly Anglican and Protestant town of York in 1847. The Toronto I know is about acceptance and tolerance. We help the vulner vulnerable. This is our inheritance, which is worthy of preservation. We are a welcoming cultural mosaic. Thank you, Terry. Alana? Um, I, I think that you know, working towards a truly great city means uh, a city that's celebrating its own evolution, its, its growth, its history, and ensuring that no citizen is, is left behind. Um, and admittedly, I might be biased, but I also think that a great city sees itself reflected in its public spaces um, because it's the places where people come together to connect, to celebrate, to confront challenges um, and choice points together. Um, and one of the things that I think is really encouraging, which, which Sean has um, referenced is that, uh, you know, increasingly Toronto isn't, isn't looking for the blank slate or the tabula rasa approach to, to building our cities. We're looking for greatness in unexpected places. I mean, I spend a good portion of my days now underneath the highway, um, which for, you know, several decades was a, um, 
uh, structure solely for cars. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it was a point of division. It was a point of debate. And now it's this incredible point of connection for, for people to come together. So I think as our city densifies, as we address the realities of COVID, as we address the realities of climate change, this, this multi-purposing, um, this uh, looking for greatness in the structures that um, make up our city and looking at it through new lenses is, is really critical. Yeah, some real repurposing happening at the bent ray right down there. Um, Arlene? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to follow up on um, what Terry was saying about diversity, because our city motto is, is diversity our strength. And so that means we meet people from all around the world and we get to see culture diversity at its best in terms of the food that we can get and the, you know, our ethnic neighborhoods. So Toronto, this is what makes Toronto great. But what I think can make it even greater is, I mean, there are so many issues that need to be addressed to make us greater and, and can't even begin to um, talk about how we can um, meet the problems of, you know, child poverty, homelessness, um, our unemployment rates, um, all these issues. But the one that I, I think that I, I like to talk about is to have a more inclusive vision of what Toronto is, because it, Toronto is a huge city. And even though we amalgamated over 20 years ago, we're still not one city. And there is really um, what I think is a disconnect between the inner city of Toronto and the inner suburbs of East York, Etobicoke, North York, Scarborough and York. So how can heritage play a role? So um, people have different stories depending on what part of the city they're from and depending on where they came from. And if you think of Toronto where more than half the people living in our city uh, were born outside of Canada, you know, all these are factors and and so this, we have to somehow all connect up and be together and even overcome somehow this distance of our city. So um, let's learn about our culture and heritage, sharing it in new and different ways. And I already see signs of that happening, very innovative way. Um, you look at Vincent Van, uh, Vincent Van Gogh, like the drive, drive through Vincent Van Gogh, the drive through at Toronto Zoo, I mean, even haunted Halloween uh, drive throughs. I mean, these are really, interesting ways so that it makes our city smaller and not so um, scary that it's so large. So one of the, the first questions people ask me is like, where are you from or where did you grow up? And so let's build on our sense of place by um, sharing our stories, no matter where we live in the city. Yes, that's really important. And Eve, we'll give you the last word on this one. Um. Well, I, I guess because I'm um, a builder <laughs> um, and developer, I looked at it from in terms of creating spaces that make it really attractive. And I think that if you look at um, some of the elements that really galvanized, um, you know, creating communities or gentrification or, you know, as much as condos have maybe gone, you know, too overboard, but, you know, 30 years ago, downtown Toronto was a wasteland. You know, nobody was there at night. You 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 would walk the streets and and it was bare. And having having people live and be part of downtown. And you know, a lot of that came because of all the immigration that has come to Toronto that makes it so so much more attractive. But I think I think great spaces and and really taking a chance and challenging, you know, the three levels of government. I mean, Toronto is the biggest um, city in Canada and the fourth largest in, in, in North America. We're viewed as being, you know, culturally diverse, racially diverse, safe. You know, safe is a huge part of why Toronto is so, and clean. I mean, if you've ever traveled anywhere, everybody else talks about how, you know, how clean Toronto is. So there's many things that are great, but, you know, there are moments and times and places we don't have the heritage of a lot of, you know, cities like Paris and um, London, nor do we have the great parks of even Paris, London, even New York, Central Park. So I think there's still opportunities to do great things. And I think the Bentway, for example, was a really great example of how you can really create something that is special, that is, is all but a surprise. But why not create the park on the railway lands? Why not do something? We've got the whole Donlands and, and look at all the islands. We've got so much more that we could do, but it's going to take guts and 
it's going to have take government being committed and it's going to take you know city builders to be involved and be supported by you know everybody in town to make us even greater yeah a lot of downtown downtowners are dreaming about the possibility of having that rail deck park yeah. become a reality in the future Me in too. this town. Um, as governments face increasing financial pressures, and you know, we always hear about tax dollars and grapple with huge issues such as affordable housing, do you think that public support for heritage is waning? Um, you won a Heritage Toronto Award, so heritage is clearly important to you. Why do we need awards, I guess, and recognition of heritage work? And how would you explain to governments and people why this heritage in our city needs to be a, a priority? And we'll start with you, Alana, on this one. Um, I think it, you know, it's, it's absolutely undeniable, the pressures on federal, provincial, municipal governments right now. They're facing huge challenges, a whole host of competing needs and objectives. But I, I truly believe that the key to our urban recovery and in, in addressing these financial pressures is in taking a more holistic and intersectional approach to the way that we rebuild. Um, and I think we can't be pitting heritage against other needs and priorities. Heritage just needs to be an essential part of the way that we build our cities, but equally build our healthcare systems, build upon our education systems. Um, I think that we, uh, as public space practitioners, we've, we've recognized recently that there, there are, you know, just key perspectives that are missing from the development of the public realm. And those are disciplinary perspectives in terms of public health, of social services, but equally lived experiences. And I think for too long, you know, BIPOC voices have not been present enough in those discussions. Um, and we recently launched a public space fellowship as, you know, a first key step in addressing some of these gaps um, and, and reaching out to people beyond traditional architects and engineers and public art practitioners. And it's amazing, we have a, a young woman who's joined um, uh, us as a public space fellow who comes from a public health background. And I have learned so much in seeing the way that she addresses equity and placemaking and placekeeping and heritage um, from the perspective of public health. So I think the practices and the priorities just can't be at odds, but have to be part of the, the same shared aspiration for our city. Thank you, Alana. Arlene? No, I just like to add that I think during these really troubling times that there's a real heightened desire for culture because it gives us comfort. Um, I know our arts and I talked about arts and culture institutions, they're doing their part, but I'm really thinking about intangible heritage. You know, we're, we're reading books, we're creating art, we're out dancing in the streets. Um, I, I think of people when, you know, they're on their balcony playing their saxophone, you know, their cars driving by honking their horns if they're celebrating a birthday. So these have all been a source of strength and comfort and it's a show of resilience and solidarity and innovation just to get us through this lockdown. So, um, and having heritage awards and recognition, I think really validates the importance and significance of our heritage. And it's really important. I think it's a priority that we always make sure that it's at the forefront there because um, it encourages us to take responsibility for it. It empowers people, um, doesn't matter where you've come from to participate. It really gives us a, a greater sense of belonging and a, and a, a, a pride, sense of pride. And most importantly, I think it's something that we can pass down to our children and our children's children. Good points. Eve? Um, yeah, I thought I would address the, um, the recognition of um, people that are, are preserving heritage. And um, I, think, I think most of all, the, the awards, it provides recognition, it provides um, something because people put so much work and effort, you know, to do anything with heritage takes so much more commitment to doing, you know, a new build or, or figuring out how to make something. But I think it also, it helps that everybody, you know, look at the commitment, you know, that some companies or individuals are, are doing to make a contribution to society, to our community, to this town. And, um, you know, I, I think that 
I don't think anybody does anything specifically for a reward, but I think when people are recognized, I think at times it it helps other people become more interested in potentially making their own commitment to it. That makes sense. If, if it wasn't for the award, I wouldn't have known about Arlene's tours of Chinatown. <laughs> Sean. Yeah, I think about um, is interest in heritage waning. Um, you know, Heritage Toronto's done some great work in reaching out to new communities and pulling them in. Um, it's uh, it's no longer uh, people over forty who go to the Heritage Toronto Awards or over sixty. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but it's it, there's a, like a whole new crop of young folk who are getting involved, which is great. Um, the thing I worry about. Uh, the future of, of kind of the heritage movement or, or interest in it in Toronto is that sometimes uh, the voices from or the loudest voices who argue for heritage um, tend to be this voice that says no. Uh, it tends to be this kind of knee jerk anti condo. Uh, like there's rav development is ravaging us. Um, you know, development is just more people. You know, and we should have a conversation about what that kind of development is it affordable? Is it rental? Uh, is it good quality? Um, but people, you know, coming into neighborhoods, that's going to. Um, heritage people, I think, to, to um, advocate for heritage, you also have to advocate for a city to allow new people in. Um, there's a whole lot of really precious neighborhoods in Toronto. Uh, I live in the west side, uh, Little Portugal, Little Italy, Cabbage Town, the Annex. Um, if you are a younger person, uh, the only, you, those, those neighborhoods are kind of off limits to you unless you can afford a million dollar house or way more than a million dollars now. So um, I get, I, I, I bristle when I hear people um, get um, upset about new development coming in in that sort of knee-jerk way. New development allows different sorts of people to come into a neighborhood. Uh, but what we should be talking about is how to make that development uh, better, affordable, uh, and more equitable. Good point. And I, I did live in Little Portugal in my 20s, and it was much more affordable back then. Mm -hmm. Terry. Well, the answer to the first part of the question is no. I believe that public support for heritage is growing. Um, why does heritage need recognition? Place memory is important. Place memory is a story to be told. It is our memory, our collective memory, the story of this place as we can write it. We inherit the environment, built and natural landscapes. They are places valued by those before us and we need to understand them. Some embody beauty your work, like, don't you forget it. and meaning, which is timeless and worthy of preserving. Some can be adapted for reuse. Heritage buildings reflect the values and aspirations of people at a particular moment in time. For this reason, these placeholders need to be protected. They reflect the technology, science, and craftsmanship of our time. Heritage construction sites are learning laboratories with hands-on training from the craftsmen mentoring young apprentices. There is an argument for conservation of the built environment from an environmental stewardship point of view. The embedded carbon in heritage buildings must be acknowledged. Awards and recognition are necessary to reward the good fight, as Eve was saying. Respecting heritage is a value that is very hard to implement and often has to be fought for against commercial pressures, inconveniences, et cetera. The difficult work of safeguarding the heritage environment has to be celebrated and promoted and recognized. Very important. Thank you for that, Terry, and your insights. It is time for another poll. It's combined from a couple of questions from our registrants. So the, this poll and the following question come from two of our attendees pulled from the registration comments. There were a lot of questions about the relationship between development and heritage preservation in this, and the city's housing needs. Now the poll reflects an issue raised by Heritage Toronto in last year's State of Heritage Report, the thorny question of facadism. Facadism is the architectural practice of conserving the exterior face of a building while the rest of the building is demolished to construct a new and often larger building. In your opinion, does facadism work? Yes, it acknowledges the building's heritage, its previous inhabitants and activities while allowing for needed intensification of that location or no, it trivializes the city's history 
and its use prevents consideration of other more innovative and creative alternatives. You have 20 seconds. I want to pick both. <laughs> Oh, 54% to 46%, but the no's have it. It trivializes the city's history and its use prevents consideration of other more innovative and creative alternatives. Interesting, okay. Anybody wanna comment on that one before we move on to the next one? Okay, so Anthony Bourdain famously said about Toronto, it's not a good looking city. I beg to differ, but that's the quote. Using a heritage lens, does Toronto's public realm deserve that description? How can we intertwine history into modern developments beyond a superficial level and into a meaningful community connection to create not only beauty, but also meeting? And Terry, we'll, we'll start with you. I've seen some of your projects and is it a bait I've had with my wife and people as you go around Toronto, does it work when you keep the outside and then you put this glass condo behind it with just this little facade out front? Well, I wanted to say that cities don't always have to be good looking to have vibrancy and a soul. We all know Kensington Market. It may not be beautiful, but it has a vitality and it is vibrant and it is memorable. It also has to do with how you define beauty. As a Torontonian, I have always appreciated the beauty of the Bloor Street Viaduct, the Don Valley in a car on the parkway in the fall. I would also suggest that we look at what the city is doing with Union Station from Union Square to Maple Leaf Square. The new multi-level con concourse below Union Station is knitting together all of these public places in the city pedestrian infrastructure in a vibrant way. My answer to the first part of the question is no. A deep understanding of the human history and what defines the character of a particular place is important when tasked with shaping any new development. You must engage on a deeper level with the community who you are designing for. In the case of St. Michael's Cathedral Basilica, the historical associations and uses are still there and active. Our job as architects is to understand these associations preserve what is most valuable and shape our new interventions around them in such a way as to reinforce and build upon the most memorable and important to the community. How can we intertwine history into modern developments in a meaningful way? At St. Michael's, part of working on the cathedral was our team's continuous learning about the history and workings of the Catholic Church, its liturgies and its community. We needed to know the history of Michael Power, the first bishop, to understand the cathedral and the work we were doing. Interventions were made. One was the crypt chapel. Human burials in the crypt chambers were dignified and their stories are now available. The tombs of Bishop Power, um, other bishops, and that of the Sisters of Loretto are now, now available to the public for viewing. St. Michael's Cathedral re Renewal is known as phase one of the Cathedral District Plan. Phase two is the St. Michael's Choir School project in design as we speak. Phase three is the future St. Michael's Center. The Cathedral District will add public spaces to the Toronto public realm. I'm loving some of the comments that people are putting up here. Anthony Bourdain did not see our ravines. He didn't go north of Bloor Street. So I, I, I do appreciate some of those comments. And Arlene, you know, Terry was mentioning Kensington Market, which is probably part of your tour. I, I know I still go there on Saturday mornings to go visit my fishmonger. Yeah, I just want to even go on, on the comment about our ravines because Toronto, I think, we have to think of Toronto in its parts and I think it's good looking in its parts. So we have all our natural beauties like our ravines, we have Lake Ontario, the Humber River, and then we have all these beautiful green spaces like High Park. Um, and then I grew up in Chinatown and so we have over 150 neighborhoods and this is what makes up our Toronto. And so how can we intertwine history to make everything, um, to create beauty and meaning? So. You know, I think we have to look at our, make our streets and parks and open spaces 
um, even more inviting. We have to keep working on improving our bike paths, our walkways, the trails that we're using. For new developments, we want to make sure we include public space so people can get together. And we're talking about a year round outdoor space so that you can have, you know, community events and you can have public installations so that people can enjoy them all year round. I think of the beautiful art installations down at Canoe Landing down by the lake where you can learn about the stories of Terry Fox, you can learn about Tom Thompson, uh, part of the group of seven. And even in the downtown, crowded downtown Toronto, there's a, a laneway at Bay and Dundas. And there's a beautiful sculpture there. It's called Two Children of Toronto Meet. And this sculpture tells the story of the immigrants who lived in what we used to call the ward. And so, um, and so they're, they're, and even a few blocks away is the construction site of our new Toronto courthouse where when it opens, there's going to be outdoor and indoor exhibits and markers and plaques that will tell the stories of the, all the immigrant groups who lived and worked in the area. So these are, I think, examples of how modern development can incorporate our history and tell it in a beautiful and meaningful way. Yeah, and you make a great point about the bike trails. COVID has led me to biking since I can't go to my spin class anymore. And I'm wondering why have people been hiding that beautiful beltway in the middle of our city from me for all these decades now that I just seem to have <laughs> discovered now. Eve, you're next. Um, well, I think, I think all of us probably are very passionate about Toronto and probably when somebody says that it's not a good looking city, we become incredibly defensive and potentially a little bit aggressive. But, um, and I think all the comments that were made about our ravines and communities and walkability. And I think it's, I think Toronto is a city that you have to actually spend time in. You know, it's, it's unfortunately not a city like you know, London or Paris or Rome, where you can get the top 10 places to go to and everybody's earmarked to go to those locations or even New York City, you know, Toronto, Toronto is a city that unfolds the more time that you spend in it and the more neighborhoods that you go to. And we have way more neighborhoods than, and than any city our size, you know, like, I mean, we just, I mean, if you look at New York, for example, I mean, Chelsea is, would be 10 of our neighborhoods right or you know so for, for me i think he probably took that drive from the airport that took him down the 427 and across the qew and then he hit bathurst well no he would have gotten all the condos that were out but you know nothing is actually worse than that wall of condos and you know i'm the condo queen like i'm part of it and i passionately believe it has made toronto a way better city by having the development that we've had downtown, but some of it is pretty horrible. And if you go through that swath, I think the challenge is for any developer and any city um, government is that you encourage also good design. So that's my guess is he was not here for a long time and he took a very specific route to get downtown and it doesn't show off Toronto to its best. Uh, Alana, we will go to you next. I mean, one of the things I, I love about the city when we, when we compare it to American cities is that the fact that people live downtown and yeah. it doesn't shut down at night because everybody's run off to the, the suburbs and we have things like the Bentway that we can go to in the evenings. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, I know when I think about the cities that often are, are called beautiful, they tend to be very homogenous. They, they came together, uh, you know, in, in a concentrated period of time. The architecture um, is is of a certain style, um, and I think Toronto has, should take pride in the fact that its built heritage is diverse and eclectic, and maybe at times ugly. But um, you know, I, I think that we should take pride in the fact that we're moving away from autonomous and homogenous planning in the interest of making meaningful connections, because that's ultimately what makes a better city. Um, and I have to say, as a, as a public art practitioner, uh, the two things that actually scare me most as drivers for public art are beautification and economic development. And not because those aren't important um, and not because we should shy away from those opportunities, but if you use them as starting points, they often neutralize projects from the start. And I think that um, I really believe in creating art that celebrates our heritage, um, by challenging us and informing us and saying something unique and engaging the community. And I think, um, you know, we can't use beauty as a crutch. It, 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 we need to 
uh, give artists and architects and um, uh, people who are shaping our city the the opportunity to to say something about who we are. And Sean, we will give you the last word on this one. I've had the opportunity to walk around downtown with you and talk about the buildings and the spacing, and everything. Our city's not ugly, Sean, is it? No, I can't, I've, can't, I've been in love with it for 20 years since I moved here. Um, and I gotta say, as a kid coming from Windsor on trips to Toronto, that coming in on the 427, rounding the curve and coming in on the Gardener, flying through the condos, which were much less then, was pretty amazing. And there is still a 16 year old inside me that drives along the Gardener now that, that feels like I'm in the Jetsons. So I think it, it is beautiful. And the Gardener is actually kind of great in that respect. And the great thing about Zoom is I won't need a security detail to get out of here tonight by liking the Gardener um, because of that. But um, Toronto has this really wonderful jumble. Uh, Elena, you said that, you know, the homogeneity of a place like Paris. You know, it was built by uh, Baron von Haussmann. It was kind of like a fascist project. Um, beautiful, but you know, um, it was a little problematic the way it came around. We are this jumble where you can have a, um, a skyscraper next door to a Victorian house and it kind of works. If you walk along Parliament Street, there's Cabbage Town, there's St. James Town. Um, that, that they, they, they've been there for 50 years and uh, they, have, they, they have not destroyed each other. Um, and there's other examples across the city. Um, in Paris, people are still arguing about the pyramid and the Louvre, I am Pays pyramid. You know, it was, it was like, are you allowed to put this thing in there? Toronto is loose and it allows for this kind of stuff to happen. Um, and it's a non-traditional beauty, but it's our own beauty. Uh, you know, Torontonians have, writers in Toronto have been worried for decades about and penning things. And I've probably written of them, a few of them. Um, you know, is Toronto beautiful? What is beautiful? But that, that messy urbanism that we have, which was quite coined by um, uh, 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 a Los Angeles urbanist named James Rojas. He was here on a conference and was walking around with me and he just said, I love the messy urbanism here, the jumble of stuff. You walk out your door, whether it's downtown or uh, the, the inner suburbs and there is always surprises on the street. It's not going to be the same thing every block. A little bit downtown with the homogeneity of you know Starbucks on every block, that sort of thing is, is, is affecting that a bit. But the jumble's beautiful and uh, I still love it. All right, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm gonna keep it moving here because we're trying to get through as many of these topics as possible. Attendees during registration also express interest in the perspectives question from issues of indigenous history to black heritage to engaging more young people. Toronto takes pride in being one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the world. Arlene, you have written about the generational success of Chinese Canadians in our town, but also about the discrimination and hostility experienced by that community going back to the earliest immigrants in the 1800s. How far does Toronto have yet to go to become the tolerant and inclusive, inclusive city we like to see ourselves as? And where should this work begin? And Arlene, I will start with you. Hey, I, well, Toronto, we've definitely come a long way. And I know that from the dark chapter of our history, when there was so much discrimination and, and injustices against not only the Chinese people, but so many other groups, the indigenous, black, Jewish, Italian, Japanese communities. Um, yes, Toronto, we should be very proud that we are regarded as being one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the world. But um, I've always maintained that you, we, can get, we can repeal discriminatory laws we can, the government has apologized for so many things, injustices of the past. But for me, the, I think the hardest thing to change are people's perceptions, attitudes, stereotypes. And so it's one thing to be ethnically diverse, but it's another thing to be tolerant and inclusive. And so that's where we have to do a lot more work. Um, everything that we take for granted, how we talk, how we dress, how we decorate our homes, these are all a continuation of our heritage that we passed on from generation to generation. And this all starts at home with our children, how we as parents talk to our children, what we teach them as, fa as values, like the value of respect, the value of understanding, the value of tolerance. And we need to continue telling these stories, not only to um, our children at, at home, but also we have to tell these stories at school. We have to tell them in the communities. We have to keep our histories at the forefront. Now, all, with the exception of our Indigenous people, all of us have come from another place at one, at one point in time. 
And it's really heartening to see more and more um, historic plaques and markers, um, alleyways that are telling the stories of so many different peoples. And I really do applaud Heritage Toronto for the work um, that they're doing. Um, all of this shows that we are really more alike than we like to admit. We share the same dreams and hopes for our children. We also, you know, we've, we've had shared experiences, similar triumphs and struggles. So these are things that we should, our similarities, we should be celebrating them and not focusing so much on our differences, which has been happening more of late. And um, we have to be, by doing so, we will learn to be more tolerant and um, inclusive. And just to remember that we're all in this together. Yes, yeah, so we, we see what's going on south of the board and it seems to be affecting what's happening here too. Terry, your thoughts and insights on this, sir. Well, my perspective is that of a Torontonian who was born here and lived their whole life here. Um, I may be too close to see it clearly or completely. Um, I can say that the Toronto I know continues to become more tolerant and inclusive. We should add more public art to the city to reflect current values. For example, new statues or representations of people who reflect a more diverse community. There should not be anything controversial about adding new art that reflects our current consensus values and aspirations. Rather than tearing down monuments, a role for heritage interpretation is required. We moved the statue and added new carved face, faces to the cathedral where the originals had been lost. This work reflects our current thoughts and values while conserving the original fabric of the building. Interpretation plans tell stories about places that have changed. It is a way of revealing the heritage of a place where very little, if any, remains. It is interesting to note that Catholics in Toronto in 1842 were in a, a minority and arrived as outsiders. Robert Kern wrote an article on the pandemic and the famine in the Irish Times on July 16, 2020. The article was written on the eve of the opening of Dr. George Robert Grassets Park that Sean was talking about at the beginning in Toronto. Dr. Grasset, Grasset was a, co a compassionate man who cared deeply about helping those less fortunate. His obituary refers to his devotion to the amelioration of the sufferings of his fellow men, irrespective of hire or reward. In 1847, Toronto's population was just 20,000. By autumn of that year, more than 38,500 Irish famine migrants had landed on Toronto's waterfront. This was a public health emergency and economic crisis of immense proportions. Dr. Grasset and Bishop Power both died as a result. Today, Catholics are an important and influential faith group within the community and city we call Toronto. Thank you for that, Terry. Sean? Yeah, just maybe a couple words about plaques, you know, versus statues. Um, uh, the statues have become problematic uh, or, or controversial in many ways. P the plaques, uh, give us the potential to tell stories and give context um, to history. And I think um, it's important to, and maybe this is where heritage advocates come in, all the people watching, to tell the uncomfortable stories. Um, I know it took a long time for a, an actual historic plaque at Christie Pitts to go up to talk about the Christie Pitts riot, right? Which was an anti-Semitic riot um, that the Toronto police let happen and they watched it happen. Um, that was an important thing uh, to, to mark the darker parts of our, our history. Um, you go to a city like Berlin, um, they, they don't shy away from the, the terrible parts of their history. You could be walking down the street and see three plaques to the darkest parts of history. Um, and we need more of those things. We need a plaque at Cherry Beach, uh, not just about Cherry Beach, but about the Cherry Beach Express when the Toronto police used to bring people of color and uh, gays from Church Street and take them to Cherry Beach and beat them up. Uh, we need a plaque about the bathhouse riots in 1981. Um, not shying away from the dark side of Toronto history, and it does have a dark side despite being Toronto the good, um, will make this place stronger and, and more honest honest. Yeah, I think more information will help all of us if we understand more about what took place in our town. Lana? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything um, that Sean just said. And um, I really think that 
there's an urgent need to to decolonize the practices that are shaping our city and our public realm. And you know, that applies to planning, to architecture, to governance, um, to artistic practice. Um, but I really think it begins with the questions that we pose to ourselves. And really interesting learning that I had is that we recently launched a, a project called Safe in Public Space, which is which is focused on public safety. And it was it was a COVID responsive project, but as we saw the injustices playing out across um, city streets all around the world, um, I think we instantly recognized that one definition of public safety doesn't serve all, and that we actually had to head up a much more broad conversation about what that meant um, for the broader population, because um, it was foundational to our work. And we're working with a number of artists on this project, and um, one of them being uh, the artist and arc uh, activist Cyrus Marcus Ware, who did a project at the Bentway, uh, it's up now, called Radical Love. And we, when we approached all the artists, we asked them how they measured public safety. And many people came back and you know, their position, which is often a position we take is, um, we measure public safety for all. You know, we have to be considering everybody and, and make something work for everyone. But Cyrus's response I think was really telling and is a really you know, incredible foundation for us all to learn from, which is that Safety has to be defined by the for those who are the most marginalized, and if we can make a city safe for them, we can make a city safe for everyone. And I think it's you know that could apply not just to public safety; it could apply generally to the cities that we're building. If we can make it inclusive for the most marginalized, we can make it inclusive for everyone. And we did get a chance to interview Cyrus about that project and do a feature on it. Let's get to our final poll, also pulled from an attendee question. The 2019 State of Heritage Report identified several steps for the heritage community to encourage more diverse involvement as we look to 2021 and make difficult decisions about priorities. Heritage Toronto asks the following question. And here we go. What work should the heritage community prioritize now to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion in both what stories we tell and how we tell them? expand heritage, educational and networking opportunities for elementary, secondary, post-secondary students and young professionals from all backgrounds, make space for new voices by promoting and funding new ways for Toronto's diverse communities and marginalized voices to tell their own stories, increase the availability of Toronto's heritage spaces, historic sites and museums, and museums to indigenous communities and knowledge keepers as spaces to tell their community stories, increase the visible presence of Indigenous history through art and educational markers on every corner, increase support to heritage programming outside the downtown core. And those are your choices. You have 30 seconds for this vote. Somebody says, wouldn't it be great to prioritize all of those? Oh, okay. 40% and says, make space for new voices by promoting and funding new ways for Toronto's diverse communities and marginalized voices to tell their own stories. We will continue with the next poll because I am running out of time and I do want to get as many of these done as possible. Uh, we also have some time for audience Q and A's. You've been reminded by staff throughout the evening to ask and upvote the questions you would like addressed by the panel. They will send the top questions to me to pose and we will start with the first. And I have to see where am I gonna see that? Okay, hold on here, folks. Okay. 
Okay, I have a list of questions here. So maybe I will go from the ones on my list because I was looking for the chat to see if some were being sent to me on chat and I don't see them here unless I'm not looking in the right spot. So I do have a hard copy of some questions received from the registration process that uh, were not addressed in our Q&A. So as inner suburbs are redeveloped, should we preserve the heritage of previous suburban times? Example, Don Mills retention of modern architecture in the suburbs. Eve, you want to take a crack at that one? No? Your microphone is still muted. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's great examples where we should be um, protecting. You know, a lot of people don't think the 50s, 60s, 70s are part of the fabric of our city, but they really are. I think the saddest example that I can think about is the Davis Davisville Public School, which was in a beautiful, beautiful building that ended up getting demolished with the city's permission. So I think that, you know, Don Mills was a really, really critical part of the evolution of Toronto and the early suburbs that were done and that you don't keep all of it, but you do respect the integrity and the fabric that it showed and you find a way of preserving it to some extent. Harry, I think this would be a good one for you. What are the major challenges developers face in restoring and repurposing heritage buildings? <laughs> well, um, I think number one, if you're repurposing a heritage building, um, you're taking it somewhere that perhaps um, it wasn't originally planned for and there are certain complexities that come with that. Um, the challenges are always trying to understand the condition of the existing fabric and uh, it's what we call the, um, the discoveries, the things that never were anticipated in the project to begin with, but as you begin to work on the, uh, the heritage building, it will tell you where it needs help. Um, I think um, getting consensus uh, from the, um, you know, the um, authorities that have jurisdiction on um, all that has to be done to the heritage fabric um, presents uh, challenges. And I think Eve mentioned it, uh, working on heritage buildings. Um, there's a dimension to it that um, is quite different and requires um, a different energy than um, creating and um, designing uh, greenfield new builds. Arlene, I'd, I'd like to give this one to you. What other ways would be effective in recognizing heritage achievements besides awards? Can cultural heritage celebration help in raising the community's profile and how? Um, yeah, I don't think we just necessarily have to recognize through awards because even, um, I mean, Heritage Toronto and other organizations have done really good things in terms of, again, doing this intangible heritage um, um, having um, events featuring in, in, in my community Cantonese opera and you know that was almost like a, a forgotten art but was such an important part of our early uh, Chinese history. So um, there are different ways to acknowledge um, cultural contributions and I did want to add to the, um, the, the first question about pres preserving previous suburban times because I wanted to say that I think it's really important that Again, I, I, I talked earlier about the, the disconnect between inner Toronto and the inner suburbs. And I'm thinking of an example in Scarborough. We had a, a Dragon Mall that was built there in 1984. And it was, um, I think it's gonna be torn down to build a condo. And I think there should be a commemoration and there is some work being done so that that site is commemorated before the mall comes down because when it opened up, it really caused, it really hit the headlines in, in the media because there was such an outcry in the community. Um, what happened was this, it was a Chinese shopping mall, was the first of its kind, and it really attracted people from everywhere. So the, even though the parking lot was built be, um, above code, uh, there were so many cars that the, all the parking um, flooded into the neighboring uh, streets, um, which, resulted in a lot of anti-Chinese meetings that were held. So, um, but what did 
result because of this mall was the development of a very large and still very vibrant Chinese community in Toronto, one of the, the largest concentrations of Chinese living in the city. So I think it's important that we still really recognize these, even if it's in the suburbs, that we recognize places like this because they're so important, not only for that particular suburb or vicinity, but it's important in our history of our city. Yes, very important. As a child of North York, I, I appreciate you making that point. Um, Mr. McAuliffe, could I, could I talk to you about sustainability in, in design and development in our town? Sure. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that aren't necessarily always in fashion, um, and especially in politics. Um, but, you know, thinking about heritage, uh, somebody once said the greenest building is the building that's still standing, right? And I think I'm gonna bring up schools again, like we're seeing a lot of, uh, like the Davisville school that you've mentioned, you know, it was a perfectly fine school that could have used a really great mid-century modern reno, uh, but instead we built, we tore, we're tearing it down and building a new school. Um, Did we do something with North Toronto like that where they mixed the old and the new? The one, yeah, the uh, right off of well, Young, Young and Eglinton, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was kind of a, it's, it's, we should be doing more of that, right? Um, you know, using the base of heritage, you know, heritage is actually green because we expend, expelled a lot of energy uh, and time uh, to, to build it. So um, you can make a really good green argument for heritage preservation. And finally, Elena, I'll, I'll give this one to you. What efforts are now being made to acknowledge and recognize Toronto's and Canada's multicultural past? And, and I know some of that is being done at the bend, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's really encouraging to see the poll results uh, come through. And the most important thing, I think, is giving people opportunity to tell their own stories. Um, we don't always have to you know, rely on the institutions uh, to do it. I think the more that we can create funding opportunities and platforms for people to feel empowered to, to tell their own stories and to recognize that, you know, no, no history in the city is linear. It's all layered. Um, no place is, is of one community. It, it's um, a product of many communities' contributions over time. So we need, we need to make sure that those stories are heard and, and um, foregrounded by the people who lit them. Yes, very important and a good point to end on. And I am seven minutes over time. So I'm going to thank you guys for your time and thank you for your patience and to the attendees for those great questions. Um, it is all the time we have. Alana, Arlene, Eve, Sean, and Terry, wonderful discussion. Really appreciate those insights. Um, I've learned some things tonight. Uh, Aaron Sanderson from Heritage Toronto. He is a board member and there's Mr. Aaron himself. He's going to close things off with us by making some remarks on behalf of the organization to now conclude the evening. So thank you all. That was fun. On behalf of Heritage Toronto and my fellow board members, many of whom are, are with us tonight, I wanted to thank you, Dwight, for hosting this evening. And of course, to our amazing panelists, Alana, Arlene, Eve, Sean, and Terry. I wanna also thank Mike York and the Carpenters Union Local 27 for sponsoring tonight's event. They've been loyal supporters of the awards program and I look forward to enjoying a drink with all of you at the mayor's reception at the 2021 event. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. It means a lot to be able to gather in celebration because of course, 2020 has been quite a difficult year. One in five charities have permanently cut their services or shut down. And the sad truth is that many more will follow suit before we make it through our COVID recovery. So thank you all so much for your support of Heritage Toronto. Without it, the agency would not be succeeding amid all of the challenges that's presented themselves in 2020. This includes donations in support of the Emerging Historians Program in particular, which have allowed us to develop new, diverse, and timely content like the Little Jamaica, Lady Action, and Indigenous Roots digital tours, even while we've been forced to reduce staff by nearly half. While we're excited to be here at the, tonight's uh, event together, we cannot forget that the cancellation of the Heritage Toronto Awards this year was also the cancellation of our largest annual fundraiser. This will have a direct impact on our future programming. And so as you depart this evening, I humbly ask that you consider making a donation tonight at heritagetoronto.org. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you, Dwight.
Good night, all.